We're back here with Jonathan Holmes talking about gender identity. And in the last session, if you didn't catch that, we talked about what is, uh, how does our society currently view uh, gender and sex and those questions? And then what does the Bible have to say and how can we think about it biblically? So if you missed that, you definitely want to go back and listen to that first because it really lays the groundwork for what we're about to talk about, which is how do we live that out? Yeah. How should we respond? How should we act yeah. when we encounter these questions? Yeah. So thank you again no, for taking this for time. Thank you for having me. So let's start out by talking about what is a wrong response? What are some things we definitely right. want to avoid? Right. One of the things I think, especially as Christians, either as Christian educators or just Christians in the public square, is we want to stay from, we want to stay away from uh, just stories of disgust or responses of disgust. Like, that's so weird, or that's so odd, or just a sense of rejection of mm -hmm. that. I don't want to have anything to do with that. On the other side, I also don't think that we can just offer outright affirmation either of just, yeah, that's fine. You're born this way. Just do whatever you want. And so somewhere in the middle of that has to be a movement where Christians can speak truth and love, develop their convictions, and hold them with compassion. Mm -hmm. And so trying to know maybe where you lean on the spectrum of either towards just being really turned off by that or disgusted by that because it's just different and confusing or maybe saying, yeah, I think it's okay. Maybe knowing your tendency on either side can help move you towards, I would say, a biblical pathway of mm. being able to speak truth and love. Right. Yeah, it's really helpful. So let's walk through this in a couple different yeah. scenarios. Let's start with um, Christian schools, yeah. okay? So if you're working in a Christian school, uh, part of what in your seminar you talked about developing the right concept of yeah. gender identity and sexuality right. um, for teens and even yeah. for children. What, what are just, I would say this could be a whole other topic, but <laughs> right. what are a few things that, that would be helpful just for Christian school teachers that have the freedom to totally talk about this from right. a biblical perspective? How can we help students develop right. that right concept? It's a great question. And, and going back to what we talked about last session, that's where I think sexual discipleship is so important. And if Christian teachers in a Christian school setting have the opportunity and the platform to talk about these issues from a biblical framework, then I would hope that we could take advantage of those opportunities. And one of the things that we can do is just putting forth a positive, compelling vision for gender and for mm -hmm. sexuality. So often we, we talk about these things behind closed doors, proverbially, or uh, we just depend on other people or books or pastors or counselors or our youth group leaders to educate our students about sex or gender or, or even our bodies. And the Bible just does not shy away from that. The Bible is really honest, as we talked about in the last session, that God created us male and female, that he created a complementarity between genders that's actually a signpost of his original goal and intention. And so I think for us to be able to talk about those things openly and honestly, but to frame them as something good, mm -hmm. that they're actually a gift, and also that that not only are they good and a gift, but it's actually the design that God has intended for us. And so as human beings who are dependent, made in his image, our goal is to live in accordance with who God is and what he's called us to be. And so the goal then is an alignment of who I am and my sense of identity with who God says I am and what he created me to be. Yeah, that's so helpful. So rather than Sometimes it can just feel like a list of rules for teens, right? Yes. Don't do this, yes. don't do don't, that. This yeah. is a, these are all the things right. that are out. But you're saying, not that you don't say that, but that right. you're building this positive vision of this is God's right. beautiful plan, and this right. is how we fit into it, and right. just this this is what the gospel right. looks like walked out. Absolutely. Here's what God actually says yes to. He says yes to the unity of both body and soul, and that your body can be used as a way to bring honor and glory to God. Yeah. And, in, and in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul picks that up actually. He says, you know, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you've received. And he moves forward. He says, you know, abstain from sexual immorality. But he doesn't just talk about sex. He also talks about work. He says, hey, I want you to, to live a life that's pleasing to me through the way that you work. Right. And then at the end of the chapter, he moves into talking about grief and the Lord's return. He says, hey, I want you to live a life pleasing to the Lord in the way that you grieve and deal with hard things. So it's not just about sex that the Bible has a lot of prohibitions on. It's about every area of life that God says, no, from the way that you handle sex in your body to the way that you work to the way that you deal with hard things and grief, those are all ways that you can glorify God and actually live into your calling. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that's so helpful. Let's 
let's move on into talking about what if we know people, whether they're students or just yeah. people in our lives, that are dealing with uh, gender dysphoria yeah. or transgender. We talked a little bit about this before, but can you expound just again on why is it important to get to know them right. first? Right. I'll use an illustration that I'm sure all of all of your listeners and your audience can resonate with. You know, you might have a student come in on a certain day and maybe they're really angry or frustrated or irritated, and you might deal with them in a certain way that just deals with that very small tip of the iceberg. But then you start asking them questions and you know they haven't gotten a lot of sleep and they lost their homework and they're coming from a broken home or they're under a lot of peer pressure or their girlfriend just broke up with them and you realize that what you saw mm -hmm. on the tip of the iceberg you start asking a few more questions and you realize oh there's a lot more going on same thing with gender dysphoria uh, mark yarhouse who's a clinical psychologist at regent university says that gender issues are like the tip of the iceberg you know and you might want to focus on that right away but underneath the iceberg are a lot of other issues that are going on that you as a teacher can explore and ask questions of. You know, questions of rejection mm. and affirmation and acceptance. You know, why do I not feel connected to or why do I not feel accepted by this person or by this group of people? Or why do I feel the way that I do? Why do I feel disconnected from my biological sex? Or why do I have feelings of anxiety when I go into this room or go into this particular setting? And so a lot of the time, I think once you drill down below the surface of the iceberg and do a little bit of deep sea exploration, as it were, I think that you can begin to see some other things that are going on that actually are going to provide a lot more common ground that you could explore with them rather than just only having a conversation about that, you know, 10% of the iceberg that you see. Right. So the temptation might just be just to see yeah. that piece right. and realize right. there's so much more right. and even that, and we can engage them on all yes. those other issues yes. that are less controversial and you right. can really, really help them. With. Right. That's awesome. Like for instance, I, I, I had a young man and, you know, that, that dynamic of just boys, you know, are a little bit more, uh, oriented towards sports and being outdoors and things like that and you know he just did not feel that he felt much more connected to uh, the girls in his classroom and having conversations deep what he would call emotional conversations <laughs> and over time all of his peers began saying well you know either you're gay or maybe you're a girl and that began to sink into his own huh. thinking and he actually began to question well maybe that's why I am the way that I am and beginning to move forward, he did experience a lot of feelings of gender dysphoria. But after we moved through some of that external noise that was going on around him, it was just that sense of, I don't feel accepted by my own gender, by my huh. own peers. And that sense of, do people really like me? Do they love me for, for who I am? Um, so sometimes just moving below the surface, I think, can be helpful in this yeah, conversation. Yeah, just really helping them yeah. understand why why do I have these questions? Right. Where are they right. coming from? Right. And, and, and dealing with that right. rather than you need the to change your gender. Kind of, right, right, exactly. Right. You might not be experiencing these things because you need to change your gender to become a female. You might be experiencing some of these issues because you don't feel accepted. You're afraid of rejection. You don't know how to relationally connect with people of the same gender or a whole host of other things. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Can we talk, pause a little bit here and, yeah. and talk, since we're talking about having conversations with students, about just some ways to have wise conversations with students, yeah. with all students, whether they have gender dysphoria or, or right. not. Yeah, I think one of the two things, ask good questions and listen for good answers, you know? And it sounds, it sounds a bit perfunctory, like, okay, yeah, we know how to ask good questions. But as we mentioned earlier, we sometimes can ask bad questions. You know, we can ask questions that are actually not helpful. And, you know, going back to First Samuel, you know, Eli tells Hannah, or he actually asks Hannah, he says, why are you drunk? You know, he, he, yeah, he takes, he takes an assumption or he takes external data and he makes an assumption and a conclusion on it. God is obviously a much better question asker than any of us are. So whenever he's asking questions in scripture, we want to pay attention, you know. In Genesis 4, uh, after Cain has killed Abel, he sees Cain and he's just, he asks him two simple questions. He says, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? Hmm. Right. Now he's God. He knows everything, right? right? He doesn't need to ask any questions. So why do it? Well, there must be something really purposeful about asking questions that actually images God. Huh. That God is a God who moves towards us and inquires of us. And so the way that God asks questions is that he wants to get to the heart of the issue. 
hey, I see something on the outside. Tell me what's going on on the inside. I see that your countenance has fallen. You know, uh, another way to say that might be you look kind of sad. <laughs> you know, why is that so? Why are you angry? And you, you look throughout the narrative of Scripture, the movement is that God is somebody who is really eager to inquire about what's going on in our life and in our hearts. And not only does he ask questions, but he also follows up and he listens. Um, Psalm 116 says that the Lord inclines his ear to us and that he hears us. And as teachers, as counselors, as, as, as people that are in churches, lay leaders, etc., one of the ways that we build relationships then with, like you said, not only students who are experiencing gender dysphoria, but just really any student, is that we ask questions and we, we listen well for answers. We're probably not a culture that does very well with listening. And so that's a skill that I think all of us can grow in. I, I, I tell all the people I do training with that God gave us two ears and one mouth. <laughs> so in terms of a ratio of how things are designed, I always try to keep that in mind in terms of listening to speaking. Yeah, that's, that's great. And um, last week, I recorded the interview with Crystal yes. Kershaw, which you guys should definitely check out. It's about uh, counseling students. And one thing that she mentioned, because I know as a teacher, your thought is, well, when am I going to have time for all these right. conversations? And she had a great tip, she said, to invite students to come help you with something. Mm. Can you come yes. help me uh, yes. with just something in my classroom? Right. And as they're there, that gives them a reason to be there, yeah. and it gives you an opportunity to engage with them yeah. rather than just, you know, can you come by or, exactly. you know, for 20 minutes? That's not yeah. really going to happen. So I thought that was really right. helpful to kind of practical, how does this look, what We've, does this look like? We find that to be so true at Fieldstone with a lot of our adolescent clients to be able to actually do activities with them rather than, you know, for a 14 year old boy, it might seem a little bit odd to just sit across from another person and talk for 15 minutes. Right. And so <laughs> one of our counselors might play a game of chess with, with <gasps> the person, or they might go play a game of pickup basketball, but it gives um, them an activity or something they can help with that will then kind of diffuse maybe the, the seriousness of a conversation. So. That's a that's, that's a great, great way. That's a great way that I think that you can build in time for those types of conversations. It's awesome. So next question I have is one that I know a lot of teachers yeah. have, and it's a super practical question. Yeah. And that is, what advice do you have um, when students ask you to use their pronoun of choice? What are your right. thoughts on that? Yeah. What you know, Linda, it's such a good question. It's a question that I've really wrestled with and that I've thought a lot about and that I'll just say at the outset that Christians, Bible-believing Christians who share a biblical vision of gender and sexuality have come to some different conclusions on. And so what conclusion I might come to might be different than other people. Um, one of the things that I try to ask myself is, uh, who am I talking to? If I'm talking to somebody who I know is from a Christian background or from a background of faith or who is even a professing Christian and saying, I don't want to be this gender anymore. I'm now this gender and I want you to use these pronouns and this name. I would probably take a little bit more of an inquisitive approach to that. I would want to ask them a little bit more to help me understand what's going on because I would say, from what I understand from Scripture, Scripture gave us gender as a gift. God created us with gender, and that's a gift, and that's a good thing. So help me understand what's going on inside. Mm -hmm. And so I'd probably be more curious and maybe less ready to just acquiesce to that request right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Now, if they were just a person I didn't know, or they were not a believer, not a professing Christian, uh, I would probably use their preferred name uh, as much as I could, but maybe not so much their preferred pronoun. The preferred pronoun a lot of times obviously carries with it the gender, you know, her, mm -hmm. he, she, him. Um, and sometimes in conversation we can just use the name, and the name can be, I think, a little bit of an easier way to address them rather than even using the personal pronouns. Now, that would be my personal belief because in that moment, especially with an unbeliever, what I'm trying to do is maintain relationship and I don't want to disengage them or to put an even further gap between the two of us by virtue of, well, I don't want to use your name so that I never have an opportunity to actually build a friendship or a relationship with them. So that's why I, for an unbeliever or a not professing Christian, I would be more willing to use their preferred name uh, when possible. The caveat that I would put with that is some Christians might come to a different conclusion and say, I just don't think that I can do that. I don't think that 
you know, God made them a male and they were given a male name. I just conscience wise don't think that I can do that. And Paul tells us in Romans 14, 23, that what is not done from faith is sin. And so as a believing Christian, if you're not able to do that, I don't want you to sin against your conscience. Right. You know, you have to do what you think is the right thing to do based off of what scripture calls us to. Uh, Paul will tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 5, he says, I want you to be operating from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a sincere faith. And that triad of sincere faith, pure conscience, and a, and a pure heart, um, I think are really instructive for us too as we come to this. You know, if your goal in talking to somebody who is transgender is to build a relationship with them, then, and you're able to use their name with a clear conscience, then I think that that's a good step at building a relationship. But if not, then I think that you'll probably have to reevaluate in that moment that there could be a risk of rupturing that relationship by virtue of your refusal to use their preferred name. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might come to me and say, well, I want to be called Bobby. And in conversation, I'm like, well, you know, you're not Bobby, you're Linda. And as an individual, you might say, well, you don't, you know, I don't even want to talk to you. You're not even willing to call me by my name. And, you know, relationships done and over. And there's not an opportunity for uh, further conversation. That's just the risk that you mm -hmm. run, I think, in that scenario. So you're saying, First, you have to you have to pray about this. You have to yeah. you have to kind of examine your heart. But yeah. the conclusion you've come to for yourself, and yes. and many teachers might yes. come to, is that maybe the relationship yes. is is worth yes. using this name. Yes. And and by using the name, you're not you're right. not endorsing right. anything. Right. You're just using the name that they choose. Just like they kind of ask you to use a nickname exactly. and maybe try to avoid the pronouns as much as you can. Right, exactly. And I, I think avoiding the pronouns, and again, some people might hear this and say, oh, that sounds a little bit like you're trying to, you know, walk a legal fine line. <laughs> and, and yeah, we're trying to be as nuanced as we can without not sacrificing biblical truth. Names, I find a lot of times are less gender specific than actual gender pronouns. You right. know, Chris, Sam, uh, you know, like those might be names that could be boy or girl names. I grew up in the South and Ashley was a boy's name, right. not a girl's <laughs> name. Um, and so names, I think, are a little bit more open to interpretation, whereas gender pronouns are obviously gender specific. Um, but again, I think that those convictions have to be developed in community by prayer, uh, which you which you rightly mentioned, and getting the, the wisdom of maybe your pastor or, or wise people around you as well. Well, thanks so much. Like, hopefully that gives you guys something to yeah. think about because I know a lot of you have that issue yeah. and sometimes there's even legal obligations yes. and you're wrestling yes. with those. So hopefully that'll help you. It's a tough issue. It's a, it's a good <laughs> question, but it's a tough issue. And and like I said, Linda, that, that people from varying backgrounds have arrived, had arrived at different conclusions. So as you're we talking about these different pronouns, uh, in your seminar, you shared some couplets that I found yeah. so helpful. Would you mind sharing yeah. this with us? Because I think right. it's helpful in this question and it's helpful in so many other things as well. Right. Those couplets come from Pastor Kevin DeYoung. He's written a really helpful book called What Does the Bible Teach About Homosexuality? And it's a book that is more oriented towards homosexuality rather than gender identity issues. But some of the things that he shares in one of the appendices in the book uh, I think are are universally applicable. And he just offers some different couplets that I think are really important. And what it's based on are things that you and I have already talked about, about the importance of knowing who you're talking to. And the importance of knowing who you're talking to then helps you, uh, what we would say, uh, contextualize, contextualize your conversation. So he says, if we're speaking to cultural elites who despise us and our beliefs, we want to be bold and courageous. And I would tell Christians, especially the educators that, that you're seeking to reach, Linda, that there's not a need to be ashamed about the biblical teaching about gender and that there can be a boldness and a courageousness that says this is what Scripture teaches and it's good, it's right. It's not old fashioned, it's not weird, it's not puritanical, it's not old, you know, it's not any of those things. It's actually good. Uh, God said that it's good. And so we want to be bold, bold and courageous when we talk to people like that. He says if we're speaking to strugglers who fight against gender dysphoria or same-sex attraction, we want to be patient and sympathetic. And so for those strugglers, as we've already mentioned, for people who 
genuinely are struggling with that sense of dysphoria or dissonance or something's not right inside, we don't want to just stereotype them or malign them or call them crazy. We want to be patient and sympathetic. We want to reach out to them. He says if we're speaking to sufferers who have been mistreated by the church, we want to be apologetic and humble. You know, bullying is a major issue for the transgender community. And for transgender youth or adolescents who have been bullied, as Christians, I think that we can build bridges of rapport with them and say, that's not right. Mm -hmm. We're sorry that you went through that. We're sorry that you've had that experience. That's not right. Um, he goes on to say, if we're speaking to shaky Christians who seem ready to compromise the faith for society's approval, we want to be persuasive and persistent. And some of us might be at different spots in our own understanding of this where we might be tempted to say, I don't know, that sounds, that sounds too hard to handle and it would be a lot easier if everybody could just do whatever they wanted to, maybe do what was right in our own eyes. And I think when we're having conversations like that, we want to be persuasive and persistent that what God's word says is true and right and it's good. And we want to be persuasive to say, listen, this is the right way. He says, if we're speaking to gays and lesbians, or let's say transgender people as well, who live as the scriptures would not have them live, we want to be winsome and straightforward. And that balance of both winsomeness and straightforwardness, uh, we might say is just speaking truth and love. Right? We want to be honest about our convictions, but we can do it in a compassionate way without compromising our convictions. And then finally, he says, if we're speaking to belligerent Christians who hate or fear homosexuals or transgender people, we want to be upset and disappointed. Mm. And there's just no room for that type of hatred or disgust uh, with the biblical ethic of love. And so we rightly want to confront that type of behavior uh, when we see it. That is just so helpful, especially just in understanding um, just you have the different audiences, yeah. especially am I talking to a believer right. or a non-believer? Right. Right. And that's just gonna gonna look, it's gonna right. change, you know, not what you believe, right. um, not what is true, yeah. but how you go about that conversation. And, and, and you see that type of contextualization with Christ. When you see him interacting in the Gospels, he doesn't just have one sermon that he just pulls out of his back pocket to just preach to every single person. He preaches the same message. It's a, it's a message of, of grace that we're sinners and that we're in need of redemption. But he articulates that out and preaches it out and lives it out in a hundred different ways. Conversationally, publicly procl proclaiming it, a lot of different ways based off of who his audience is. So there's not a compromise on the message, but there's a right understanding of who am I talking to and what's, what's most beneficial in the moment that I think all of us can learn from his approach there. Right, and our goal is keeping that right testimony, building yeah. relationships. What are some general principles we can keep in mind as we seek to have the right testimony yeah. in conversations with people? Right. I think one of the things is that we want to make sure that our relationships are built to build bridges for the gospel, that we're not using our relationships to win debates. We're not using them to influence people into a specific position per se. Uh, there's a lot of people who might have what we would say a biblical view of gender and sexuality, but who might not know Christ. And so our primary goal is that people would know Christ, that right. they would treasure Christ, that they would love Christ, that they would be disciples of Christ. Out of that, we hope and we pray that understanding of gender and sexuality comes from that. But we want to make sure that, that's, that the gospel is always primary. And so we want to allow that to guide our conversations. Uh, I say another thing is just making sure that we get to know the whole person. Again, we've talked about that before. Uh, I had a good friend at uh, one of our campuses at Parkside um, who was a well-known football coach in our area. And, uh, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, Saturdays he would play his games, Sundays he'd come to church, and he said Sundays were always the hardest day for him because the only thing that anybody ever wanted to talk to him about on Sundays was, hey, how's the game on Saturday? Did you win <laughs> or did you lose? And uh, he'd often tell me, you know, I'm more than just a football coach. Like, I have a family and I have likes and interests, and, and there's a lot more to me than just my job right. or what I do. And same thing I think can go for gender identity. You know, make sure, again, going back to that iceberg illustration, a person might be struggling with gender dysphoria, but there's a lot more that you can talk about. Don't just use that as the only point of connection. If you do, you're going to fall off the iceberg pretty soon. You're not going to have very much real estate to travel. And so just developing, I think, a wide base for relationship is important. That's awesome. And for those of you that teach in public schools, you might be thinking, okay, I'm supposed to keep the gospel as the focus, but yeah. 
you know, I, I'm not allowed to share the gospel, yeah. but keep in mind that every relationship yeah. you build, God can still use, right? It can Absolutely. be a piece. When you we think, hear people's testimonies, there's so many pieces in there. Absolutely. And if the gospel is still the goal, yes. God can use you uh, as a piece in that yeah. puzzle. And, and you never know. Sometimes students graduate, you reconnect, yeah. and, then, and then you have freedom to yeah. share. So yeah. let, me, let me share an encouragement then for your teachers and your audience on that point. In, in Mark chapter 4, in the parable of the sower, you know, Jesus is giving this parable and he says, you know, there's a sower who goes out and he's sowing seed and the seed's the, the gospel, it's the message. And he talks about all the different grounds, you know, that it falls on, thorny ground, rocky ground, good soil. And we normally think of it primarily from the perspective of the sower sowing the seed and, you know, what type of ground. But a lot of times, like you were saying, a teacher might be somebody who is pulling rocks away from the seed mm. to allow it to flourish or who might be pulling thorns away from a seed to allow it to not get choked out or who might be heaping some fertilizer and water and sunshine on top of a seed and again we might not be the harvester but a teacher a godly teacher who loves his or her students well might be a component in that student's life that years down the road might reap a harvest and that can be an encouragement for all of us, even us included, that again, how God uses our conversations and our words, you know, ultimately we might not know the impact right then, but down the road, I think oftentimes God uses those things in a person's life. Thank you for sharing that. That is yeah. so encouraging. Let's move on to this last section that we want to talk about is particularly um, more for Christian teachers in public schools. Yeah. And so a few just practical implications of this. Um, so first of all, how should we interact? We've already talked about this a lot, but with a student that has gender dysphoria, keeping in mind, you know, we have these limits. For example, you were telling me earlier about this website that has some detransitioning stories. Right. Is that something that we, it might be wise to share with a right. student? Right. I, I do think that it would be a good option because sometimes, again, culture can say, this is what you're feeling. You're feeling the sense of dysphoria. This is the answer. And I think that there are probably other ways that that dysphoria could be addressed. And one of the issues that I think presents a little bit of a troubling statistic, especially for transgender youth and adolescents, is that they have significantly higher rates of anxiety, depression, suicidality than their cisgender peers. So their peers whose biological sex and gender identity are lining up. And so one of the one of the difficulties that that we can gather from that data is that maybe there's a narrative that's being sold to some of these children of okay this is what you feel and if you move forward and get this done or identify like this then you'll be happy you know you're going to be okay you won't be depressed or anxious or you'll be accepted you'll be loved you'll be happy with who you are if you do this well they get on the other side of that either the hormone therapies the counseling the the change in name and gender and they realize I actually still have all of these struggles. What do I do with that? And so I think as a teacher, what you can do in a very helpful way and in a way that is in keeping with whatever uh, ethical guidelines are in place as a teacher to say, you know, are there, are there other things or other opportunities that you could explore? Have you ever thought about counseling or talking to a religious leader? Are you involved in uh, a local community of faith where you could talk to an individual just to get another perspective? Um, I think that that can be helpful. Those stories of detransitioning can be helpful too, if not even just for your own benefit, maybe even for the benefit of a particular student to say, hey, here are some people who did go through some type of transition and who realized it actually didn't solve the issue that they were hoping that it would solve. And there's some regret, there's some uh, wishing that they would have tried or done something different. And just as a teacher, I just want you to be aware that there are other options out there other than just this particular pathway of completely changing your gender. Yeah, so just, and this is in combination with all we talked about before, right? Getting to know someone, yeah. dealing with the other issues, right. not just the tip of the iceberg, right. but maybe as the opportunity presents itself saying, you know, hey, have you, have you considered this? Did, yeah. you, did you know right. that there's people that have done this and, right. then, and then come to realize that they wish they would have known about this earlier? Exactly. I, I just want you to know all the, Right. You know, you're, you're not necessarily trying to convince them if you're not right. allowed to, but you're right. just presenting, have you, have you thought, have you considered yeah. all these options? Right. Yeah. And, and again, as teachers, you realize that 
that teenagers and adolescents, that their desires change often, that their feelings change often, and that in trying to capture maybe a stable or a consistent sense of who they are, <laughs> it's a little bit like trying to catch lightning in right. a bottle. And so one of the things that you can do is just be a consistent, loving presence in their life um, that affirms them, that loves them, that is there for them. And something like that is just unmistakably just a good thing, you know, that you can present that and be that for a student. Yeah, that's such a great reminder. So the other side of this question is, uh, so there's obviously, you know, students. We've yeah. talked about a lot about how to yeah. interact with them. But there's also a not bigger issue, but just another side to it of policy. And yeah. in, these, in this, you know, this decade, the coming yeah. decade, schools are still trying to figure out how do we handle this? Right. What are our policies looking right. like? How can a Christian teacher, as you know, as their opinion is asked, or if they're on a on a panel, or mm -hmm. just how can they wisely advocate for yes. policies that are going? Because as Christians, even we know what is going to help and what yep. isn't. And even if we can't share the biblical, all the biblical, right. how can we wisely advocate? Right. How can you wisely advocate for what we might just say would be Judeo-Christian values or morals? Um, that's, I think you're right, that question is becoming increasingly difficult to answer in our culture. And so again, you're, you're left with two different extremes of do we just become completely assimilated by our culture and just go that way, or do we just completely withdraw and mm -hmm. say, well, you know what, you can't really be Christian in public education anymore, you just need to completely disconnect. I don't think either of those options are, are, are necessary. I think that there's always a middle option of how can somebody have a prophetic voice and witness in the midst of a difficult culture. And so maybe Christian school, Christian teachers in public school settings maybe view themselves a little bit in the tradition of an Old Testament prophet. You mm -hmm. know, the Old Testament prophets are saying things that nobody wants to hear and that nobody is listening <laughs> to, and they oftentimes get reviled and, you know, shut up, we don't want to hear from you. But yet because of their faith in God, because of the mission that God called them to, they, they, they call forth and proclaim God's message. And so I actually think that, that Christian teachers actually have a really unique opportunity, like you said, to be public advocates in the public square and in the public market. So what does that look like? Well, the first thing is that whenever possible, I think we want to we want to be respectful of the authorities that are above us, right? Scripture says that authority is good. We all live under authority. Paul tells us in Romans 13 that the government is our authority, even when we don't like it, even when we wish our tax rates were a little bit lower, <laughs> or when government officials are doing things that we don't like. We're still called to live under their authority. So whenever possible, and when it's not in direct contradiction with what Scripture teaches us to do, I think we want to be respectful of and in submission to our authorities, our school, your principals, your superintendents, your supervisors. That's one way, is that you live a godly life that says, listen, I'm not a troublemaker, I'm not trying to be divisive. I am submissive. I am somebody who follows authority and who is supportive of our authorities and, and our structures, but who's also able to add a different voice or a different view. Um, I think that's one thing that we can do, that teachers can do. The other thing that I think that teachers can do is make sure that there is relation, I call it relational integrity, that if you're going to say this, that also your life adds up to mm, it on the other side, right. right? That the way that you're acting in your classroom is bringing glory and testimony to God. You know, Paul, Jesus tells us in John 13, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. So the things that we're saying, are they coming from a person who we already know to be someone who's loving, who's compassionate, who's patient, who's gentle, who displays the fruit of the Spirit. And I think that that relational integrity is really key. You know, yeah. We don't want to be advocating on this side for a God that we say that we follow when in practice we are just acting like everybody else. Right. right? And so that type of relational integrity I think is really important. That's integrity and credibility maybe would be the other word I'd yeah. use. Yeah, that's, so. that's, that's great. Just one follow-up to that is what what does in some cases uh, just the policies are changing rapidly. Yeah. There's situations where um, you know maybe a teacher is required to use a pronoun that, as we talked, maybe their conscience yes. won't let them. Yes. Or they are required to have books in their library yes. in kindergarten, first yes. grade yes. that particularly push a transgender 
narrative. Right. And they say, I cannot in good conscience do this. Yes. What does Christian non-compliance look like uh, in, that, in that point? Yeah, Linda, that's a, that's a terrific <laughs> that's a question. question. We probably need another segment for that. <laughs> I, that. That's a wonderful question. Well, what does scripture say? We do know scripture says that at the end of the day, we must obey God rather than men. So if we are in a position we are, we are directly having to disobey one of God's commands at the expense or for the expense of our employer, I don't think that's right biblically. And so we would need to voice our concerns, our consternation about being put into that position to the appropriate person in charge to just say, religiously and based off of my background of faith, I, I just cannot do this. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an analogous example. I know several Christian counselors and Christian therapists who are in secular mental health settings who have said, I, I just can't counsel somebody towards making this transition just based off of my faith. And that conversation was a hard conversation, but one of the conversations that came as a result of that was their supervisor, their clinical supervisor just said, well, we won't give you those kind of cases then. And so it comes out of a loss of revenue potentially for that counselor. It might shrink their caseload, but it's a way where the counselor is still staying true to what he believes scripture is calling him to, while at the same time rightly expressing to his boss or her supervisor that he or she just can't comply with something that violates their conscience. And so I wonder if some type of conversation with, you know, a principal, a superintendent or a supervisor could be had. Um, I'd say the other thing, in addition to prayer, which we, that's just a no-brainer, mm -hmm. we always want to start off these conversations uh, with prayer, is just, I would say, seek outside counsel too. Mm -hmm. Get the advice and counsel, maybe of some other fellow Christians that are within your school system that you know of, to ask them how they've navigated it, how they've handled it, um, the advice and wisdom of maybe uh, a pastor, an elder, or a ministry leader at your church. That's really helpful. So, so kind of, you're not just on an island exactly. trying to figure out yourself. So you're not you're on an island. Thinking. Absolutely. We're designed to live in a community of people. So. Well, thank you so much. I'm sure we could, <laughs> we could talk for so much longer, but this has been some really oh. helpful things, and I pray it's been helpful um, for you guys as well. Anything else you'd like to share as we're finishing up? You know, my, the, the encouragement that I'd want to give to all of you is that, that what you do and the role that you're serving is important and that God will use your words, your life, your testimony uh, for his kingdom. And he says in Galatians 6, 9, he says, don't grow weary in doing good for in due season you'll reap a harvest. So I'm encouraged to be here with you and by extension, all the people that you'll be serving this weekend and, and just know that God will, will steward and use what you give to him in a way that might not be known to us right at the outset, but that in the long term will bear a great harvest. Well, so thank you. Well, thank you so much. And uh, once again, check out all the resources and links that we'll include underneath this video and let us know what questions you have. We'll, we'll see what we can do. All right, thank you.